and we, man, ooh, I don't want to say this, I don't want to say this, I don't want to say this. And I actually had a whole different plan for this video, but I prayed before I cut on the camera for the Lord to use me and to speak through me in this video. So even in this moment, I'm being redirected. So yesterday, Holy Spirit led me to read Hosea 2 and 3. And this is not going to be a Bible study. This is not going to be a deep dive because I'm still currently studying it. <laughs> like I'm still really combing through the text and the scriptures. But one of the scriptures specifically or series of scriptures specifically that hit me was Hosea 2, 14 through 16. Therefore, behold, I will allure her and bring her into the wilderness and speak comfortably unto her. And I will give her vineyards from thence and the valley of Acre for a door of hope. And she shall sing there as in the days of her youth and as in the day when she came up out of the land of Egypt. And it shall be at that day, saith the Lord, that thou shalt call me Ishi and shalt call me no more Bali. So... I'm nobody's Bible teacher, okay? But I do believe that I have grown spiritually mature in a lot of different ways through the word and through the experience of the word. And one of the things that I've been really praying about in this season in particular is the feeling of change, the tension of the pivot. I feel so heavily that myself, and many of you are in this season of pivoting and drawing closer to the Lord because you're feeling the instability of the world that has always been there. But can we agree that instability has increased? Okay. And it feels like it's only increasing as time goes on. We are in the end times, right? So let's not get it twisted. This world we live in today is so complicated so fabricated and very, very difficult to navigate. And to be honest with you, I haven't done a real study of the word in a minute. Obviously, I just had a baby a few months ago, my fourth, and I am starting this homeschool journey, as you guys have been seeing here on the channel, and showing up work wise, as far as like being a content creator and showing, you know, getting back to the type of content that really brings me joy, but also only getting back to that content because I truly believe that the Lord has released me to get back into doing hair content again, which is a whole different conversation for another day. But if you've been with me for a while, you know, the journey that it has been when it comes to like my hair and my identity and if you didn't know, your hair actually feels your identity. So a lot of times we don't realize that we will change our hair up a lot when we're feeling confused or we're trying to find who we are. So we like to change the hair color, change the style, change the this, change the that, because we don't feel like any of them really fit who we are in that moment. And that's a whole nother thing, but I'm saying this in more of a personal experience and a personal conviction, which was when I was younger, I was always playing in different hairstyles. And while I truly enjoy styling hair and like playing with different looks and things like that, underneath it all, I was still in a way manifesting my own personal search for who I was and not finding it necessarily in the place that it was supposed to be. I was looking through the lens of hairstyles and like an outer exterior for who I was and who I was supposed to be versus going inward, checking my heart and going back to the father about why did he make me? And not even just why did he make me? Like, why did God make you is a great question to ask. But have we first recognized how loved by God we are first? Because look, Sometimes I forget about that part. Sometimes I forget 
in the hustle and bustle of life and being a mom and working and trying to show up for people and trying to manage a household and being there for my husband and paying bills, okay, that I will start to worry and forget how loved I am. And I think when we're stressed and we got a lot going on, we forget how loved we are because that's from the place that God shows up for us. And sometimes we may feel like God has forgotten about us or that he is trying to like teach us some harsh lesson through the waiting. And really God's lessons are not harsh. They feel harsh to us because we may be in disobedience or living in different lifestyles of sin. And I'm not even talking about just like clearly you out here having sex outside of marriage or clearly you out here getting drunk. Like I'm not even talking about that. I'm talking about those heart posture sins, those heart, those heart things that naturally or not even, I won't even say naturally because naturally we are a good thing because God made us. So he only makes good things. And if he made you, then you're a good thing off top, right? But I'm talking about when we live in habits and we continue cycles that were birthed out of experiences or traditions that were established before us. And the thing is, we as human beings, we latch on to the first thing we see, right? The first thing we learn usually sticks the hardest, right? That's why it says to train up a child in the way that he or she should go and they won't depart from it because God made us in a way where the first thing that we're exposed to is the thing that's going to stick. And it's very, very, very difficult to break out of that once it's been established. And think about that. If you did not grow up in a perfectly righteous home, you have some habits that have been formed and you picked up some habits from your parents, from your mother, your dad, your sister, your brother, your friends growing up that seemed good at the time, but were actually not a righteous way to be or a righteous way to live. And in Hosea 2 and 3, he is prophesying of a birth of a person, right? The son Jezreel or Yezreel. But whenever we're talking about names and places and things like that in the Bible, there's always so much more to it because God always speaks to us in layers. Like the Holy Spirit will guide you in this and will help you. But like when I was studying this yesterday, this was the first time that I felt a freedom or an ease with understanding like multiple layers of like what's happening in the scripture because you can read it from like a physical perspective of like okay Hosea is being told to go marry Gomer and have three kids okay but when you look at it from a spiritual level and the Holy Spirit is guiding you you're going to see so much more so when I'm studying, well, when I was studying yesterday, let me get my notes out so that I can have help, <laughs> which is just crazy. Cause I literally have not studied like this in a long time, like a long time. I can't even remember usually like in this season for me, since I've been, you know, busy with new baby and homeschooling and things like that, I'm leaning on my husband to just like give me whatever he's reading or I may read Bible here and there, but I'm really more so focusing on how am I, you know, praying? What am I, how am I treating my kids? How am I treating my husband? Am I doing the things that I know I'm supposed to do in this season versus like a study is kind of like that extra step that I realistically don't have time for most days. Um, so I, instead of working yesterday, I felt led to study. And so Hosea and Gomer have three kids. They have a son named Yisrael, 
I looked up how to pronounce these names correctly, <laughs> or it's J E Z R E E L Jezreel. Some people say Jezreel, like in English, but in Hebrew it's Yisrael, which means God sows, or it means that which God planted. So when we think about how we study the Bible, one of the things that always blows my mind and just like really blew up everything for me was when I realized or learned that English and Hebrew and Greek and all those things, we know that it's, things are transliterated and translated and things like that, right? We know that. But what I didn't know for the longest time was the way that the language of Hebrew or Aramaic, like what people spoke in the ancient times, how they spoke was not constructed the way that we speak English, like the language. Like in English, we see something and we say that's called a ball. Like we see a ball and we say that's called a ball, right? But in Hebrew, what they would call a ball, they would say a thing that bounces. That would be the name, a thing that bounces is rolling down the street. But their word, like the sound coming out of their mouth would be ball. But ball itself would mean thing that bounces. So instead of it being this thing where we just call it whatever we want and then (laughs) it is what it is in a simplistic way, in Hebrew, it's more about the feeling or the doing of or action of the thing that is being named, if that makes sense at all. I don't, I feel like I butchered that, but do your own research and look into it. But uh, I hope that helps a little bit. But so when I say looking into these scriptures in more of a like multi level perspective and having the Holy Spirit guide you, it's like even in the words that are being used, why is it that these three children that Hosea and Gomer have are named what they're named. They're just not random names. Like we name our kids, whatever we want to name them. Right. But like in the Bible, people's names mean the purpose or really the purpose or meaning of their lives, who they are. Let me get back to my point. My point is Yisrael means God sows. It's a name but it's also a place, right? So like Yisrael is a place, like a city, and it's also a name of a person, but it's also the name of a people. The same way that Israel, the tribe of Israel, like Israel is a place, it's a nation of people, and it's also somebody's actual name. But when you look into this, to the scriptures, you can really see, again, having Holy Spirit guide you, you can, baby, (laughs) you can see the deeper meaning of things to where it can really minister to you in a whole new way. If Yisrael is the son that God sowed or the one that God planted, then the other two siblings, the daughter and the son who are named Lo Ami is the other son, which means not God's people. The daughter's name is uh, Lo Ruama, which means no mercy, because it says, for I will no more have mercy upon the house of Israel. So think about it. You have a son that God chose or sowed, planted, a son that is not God's because that's not his people. And then you have a daughter who has no mercy from God because she is essentially the mother of Israel, which is what it gets into in a little bit. But this, this, these two chapters are really speaking to coming back to God and not in a way where maybe even in your own lifetime You were once in the church all the time and you did all the things and then you kind of fell away and now you're trying to come back. That's not what this is talking about. This is talking about when you are raised up in a way, in a fashion that is unlike God. So if you grew up in 
a household that, like I said, that wasn't righteous, that wasn't really following after God's heart. And that could mean you were still going to church every Sunday. You were, your parents were part of it. Like I'm talking about from a real true heart posture. Are you really God's child kind of thing? Are you really God's person? Are, were you really planted? So in Hosea 2, this is really getting into the character of the ones who have walked away from God. In the beginning of this chapter, it's like, oof, it's hard because I see so much of my own like life experience in it. From growing up in a society that praises people with a lot of money and people who go after their own will in their life and idolatry and and just doing whatever you want to do growing up in a society like that let having that be what I'm exposed to first and what sticks right remember like what you learn first what's established first is what sticks and so what I grew up in has was what stuck and Hosea 2 2 is talking about like the people that came before us didn't act like a faithful wife to God to Christ like the people before you were not doing the things that they were supposed to be doing so they didn't teach you the things that you were supposed to be doing they taught you what they knew and what they were doing and especially when things start to get hard and stressful and bad times quote-unquote come people before you responded in ways that God did not co-sign so instead of really locking in spiritually and depending on the father they went out and hustled and figured out a way to make it happen on their own without god went essentially going to other little g gods yes satan rules this territory this world right but everything still belongs to god nothing happens without his like okay because God will honor our free will. God will allow us to decide whose we want to be and where we want to go. So if we're choosing him, we he honors that. But if we choose to go outside of him to another source, he will honor that. There are certain principles in the earth and in the heavens that we have to and they, those spiritual things have to also abide by because we are the ones that have the dominion here. So if we want to participate in things outside of God's will, we have the right to, and God will allow that to happen. So if you grow up in a home where people are operating in ways that are outside of God's will, God's not going to just stop that because they also have dominion. Each one of us as human beings have dominion in our own way. And God is not going to just shut something down and force somebody's hand. No, every single person has to come into agreement with God's will in order for God's will to prevail. It's honestly heartbreaking that the mother, the generations before us, the people who fell away from God, Israel, just started to give credit to these other little G gods, to these, to these idols for the very things that God himself was providing. And because God is gentle and loving kindness and soft and, and, and merciful, he doesn't need the credit all the time. Like he, like it's his credit. So he doesn't need to be validated in his own thing. Like he knows who he is. Okay. He's confident in who he is and what he provides. He's just giving us grace to recognize that he is the one that's doing it all right but what it's talking about is that those times and those seasons that we attribute gifts that we receive from the lord to oh i'm so i'm so happy i'm so grateful to my job for giving me this paycheck because now i can go pay my bills like we give praise to money to being able to buy the things that we want to be able to fulfill our lifestyles and things like that we will pray and there's a god of money right there's a there's a there's little g gods that run these different things but it's, money is a big one money is is the thing that saves you from being out here on the streets right and we start to make money our god 
And we have to be so careful about that because that God is running rampant in our world. But as believers, we have to realize that like, where is our heart actually at? Like, because what it's saying is, is that, and we'll get to this in a little bit more, but at the end of this, there's a, there's a point where God says, you won't call me Bali anymore, which Bali, B-A-A-L-I-E is another name for Baal. Kingdom of unrighteousness, okay? It says, it'll be in that day that thou shalt call me Yishi. Yishi means he saved me. And shalt call me no more Bali. So in that scripture right there, it hit me because it's just like, man, how many moments, how many times have we in our hearts, not verbally, in our hearts thanked something outside of God for the things that we have out of our own ignorance because it's also in this book of Hosea where it's it says that our my people perish for a lack of knowledge like it's because we just hold on to the thing that we were shown first and as we grow up and God tries to speak to us through the Holy Spirit to change, to change a direction, to repent. And we think because it's different or because it's new or it's because it's not the way that we grew up that it's wrong. But that's why the enemy attacks us as kids before we're born. The enemy has attacked our generations prior to us because he knows that he knows that once he can settle in some bad habits and some toxicity in our bloodline he can leave us alone because we will do the damage ourselves and we will continue that cycle until miraculously it's broken and the thing is a lot of people think that you know you just ask god to change your heart and he'll change it no <laughs> no you have to actually repent of the things that have made your heart the way that they are and then actually do things that showcase your heart has changed. It's in the partnering and the doing is not about doing what you think is right. The partnership in the doing is doing what God tells you to do, what the Holy Spirit tells you to do in your heart you have to realize that you can hear the Holy Spirit for yourself. You can hear the Holy Spirit for yourself if you quiet your mind. And that's what it's talking about in Hosea 2. It's like when, when that mother that he's talking about realizes that the gifts that were actually from him don't work no more. And she's going back to Baal to get more of the gifts because she's thinking that the gifts came from Baal. She's thinking that the money came from the job. She's thinking that the money came from her ability to be smarter than another person. Like in so many ways we honor and worship gods that we don't even realize we're doing ugh, in our own ignorance because we, we are so not aware of like how all of these things work my god and we man ooh, i don't want to say this i don't want to say this i don't want to say this we celebrate and we honor paganism and these holidays that are not of god in their origin and this is something that I have been really struggling with for the past like few years. Me and my family have really been trying our best to navigate this thing because, oh my God, I'm getting emotional. Because I know this is a hard one for a lot of us, which is like holidays and like letting go of like Christmas and Thanksgiving and Easter and, and Valentine's Day and even Easter, okay? 
because the way we celebrate Easter's with Easter bunnies and things like that ain't ain't how the Lord would like us to actually celebrate Passover. And it's this thing that like me and my family have been working in the last few years trying to get to a place where we are actually celebrating the holy days of the Bible. And we're not perfect at all. We are not all the way there. We have slowly, I mean, over years, like last year was our first year not having a Christmas tree, which was a lot. Um, Because growing up, me and my husband, that was our favorite holiday was Christmas. And so, yeah, and it talks about that, like, how she would deck herself out in jewelry and earrings and go after her lovers like her other gods like and this is not just talking about like ancient sacrifices and things like that this is where are you putting your mind to who are you giving your goods to like who are you giving your time to like are you so attached to your phone that you don't have time to go into the Bible, which that's for me. I'm so attached to my phone that I'm not getting into my word. And the thing is, God is trying to pull me off my phone, pull you off your phone so that you can actually find peace. Because there's so much out here that like, the it ain't fair. It's not fair how much we have to battle against. That's why we can't try to do this by ourselves. We need the Holy Spirit. We need God's comfort to help us and guide us because there's no, the, 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 the cards are stacked against us. It says that she forgot about God, her first husband, her first love. But then it says in 14 that the Lord will allure her into a wilderness. What if... The dry season that you're going through, God, this is speaking to me. The dry season that you're going through, the desolate times, the relationships that are ending, the people that walk out of your life. Like, What if that is actually an allure from God into a wilderness, into a desolate place so that he can be the voice that you hear, so that he can be the comforting voice in your heart? Because you can't hear him with all them other people in your head and all them people around and all the all the notifications and all the things going on and all the for me, all the brand deals and all the business happening, like you can't hear God with all that stuff going on. Not when your heart is still operating out of what was established before you, which was not of him. Like he's gotta take you out of Egypt. And again, Egypt, not just being a physical place, but a mindset. You got to come out of her. You got to come out of Babylon. You got to come out of the ways that you were taught that were not of God. So that feels and looks like your gifts ain't working no more. What worked in the past ain't working no more. God is drying it up. God is alluring you. Like when I saw that, that, oh. He allures you into a wilderness. It's not you stumbling into it. It's not you did something wrong and now you're in a wilderness state. No, it's God has allured you to that place so that he can restore you in righteousness. But that takes time. That takes surgery, spiritual surgery, so that your heart and your mind can be transformed and renewed. And it says that, that's where he'll give her vineyards. When it says vineyards, it's talking about gardens so that she can again bear fruit in a future time, right? Because vineyards produce fruit and lots of fruit, not just a little bit, a lot of fruit if well taken care of, right? And if there is fertile ground in that vineyard, right? It'll bear much fruit, right? And that in the valley of Acre, which A C H O R actually means, and I'm using the Strong's Concordance for all of this like meaning stuff, but it actually means troubles. So for her valley of troubles, he will give you a door of hope. Like Matthew 6 33, like seek ye first the kingdom of God. And everything else will get be given from that point. So in the wilderness, he 
He gives you a door of hope to say, if you walk through this way, there's so much more here for you, but it's, it's going to be in a different way than what you've been exposed to before. And maybe not even just what you technically haven't experienced before, but maybe you have experienced his love and there was a time or the way you were raised up was very much so in righteousness, but you decided to walk away. You were choosing different things because of what people may have done to you, church hurt, whatever it may be, like you walked away. And so you've forgotten about him. But it says that in the wilderness, she'll sing like she did when she was young. She'll sing like she did the day that she was initially brought out of Egypt. When she first experienced freedom, when you were first baptized, when you were on fire for the Lord, all the things, that that's when she will call the Lord Yishi, I-S-H-I, which means he saved me. And you'll remember who God is because even if in this physical lifetime you don't know him, spiritually you know him he knew you before you were formed in your mother's womb so before you had physical matter to match up with your spiritual self your spiritual body existed and you were completely loved and you were whole in his love so you may not physically know god physically remember who he is but in the wilderness you'll remember who he is oh that's so good And you won't be confused anymore about where your resources come from, who you belong to. And and in that day, you'll be welcomed back into the covenant. And not just welcomed back into it, but you will choose the covenant of Abraham. The covenant of our great forefathers. that, That covenant that he promised to fulfill. And if you drop down... 19 is where it just feels like these are the promises that God has for us. It says, and I will betroth thee unto me forever. So you will belong to God forever. You'll be married. You'll be like this for real forever. I will betroth thee unto me in righteousness and in judgment and in loving kindness and in mercies. I will even betroth thee unto me in faithfulness and thou shalt know the Lord. You will know the Lord and it shall come to pass in that day. I will hear, saith the Lord, I will hear the heavens and they shall hear the earth and the earth shall hear the corn and the wine and the oil and they shall hear Israel the one God planted. And I will sow her unto me in the earth, and I will have mercy upon her that had not obtained mercy before. So, not just Israel, the one God sowed, but also his sister, Israel, the the ones that no longer had mercy And I will say to them, which were not my people, so that other brother. Remember, we had three siblings, Israel, Lo-Ami, the brother, who were not his people, and then Lo-Ruhama, who meant no mercy for Israel anymore. The three siblings, it's saying there will be a time when the Lord will say, thou are my people. And the people will say, thou art my God. This blessed me because I've been feeling called to go deeper with the Lord. And my whole family has been. But I've been so scared. And I've forgotten how much I've been loved and I am loved. And I've been allowing worry to be so loud. And I've been praying for some comfort and peace and just confidence And continuing this walk with him and allowing him to guide me continuously. Because that's what we've been doing like heavily these past few years, especially. But like really letting God be God in my life. And this confirmed so many things for me. And I needed to remember the promises that he has. 
that it's not just about getting so locked in to the fact that I'm in a wilderness season and things are looking crazy and I feel like I don't have enough food and I feel like I don't have enough resources and I feel like I don't have enough this or that, enough business, enough whatever, enough people, that the wilderness is only temporary and there is a reason for it. And I'm not there because I did something wrong, but I'm there because God allured me there. He called me there because he has something so much more for me. And sometimes we forget that while we are mothers like me, I'm serving my family and working and serving people on this platform. I forget that God loves me like I was the only person that exists. That's how much he loves each and every one of us in our individuality. Y'all, my phone died, but I'm finishing this, okay? (laughs) The Lord loves us individually so much that we have to remember that these words in this book, the Holy Spirit, all Christ, all exist for us for me, for you. So we can't get lost in the wilderness mentally and distracted by the uncomfort of it. Because one of the things that my husband reminded me of the other day was like, money is not our currency. Obedience is. Like, we have to remember that The work we do is not measured by the output of it. It's measured by the obedience of it, the obedience to do it. And as long as we stay in that place, then everything else will come from that. Everything will be provided for. We will be taken care of. Our children will be taken care of. And it will all work out. We just have to stay obedient and focused on where the Lord has us and where he's taking us and not be distracted by maybe the desolation, the emptiness, the lack thereof around us. That's all I got for y'all today. Mom! Yes. I love y'all and I'll see you in my next video.